AXA family and friends, to Common Purpose on Common Times. As always, I'm Wes Smith, your executive director, and proud to serve all of you. Uh, we mentioned last week that we were going to come together this week with a panel of experts. As I said before, this is a, a challenging conversation for me. On the one hand, as I've said, I, I think people like me need to be quiet and listen and learn more than they talk. At the same time, silence is unacceptable. And so tonight, while uh, I'm going to do a lot more listening than talking, and I'm going to use the platform that Access provided me to amplify the voices of some experts and friends in this work, I did want to say just a couple of things. Um, at, at a raw level, I'm angry. Um, I'm angry that every time we see violence against uh, people of color most often, or at least often against black Americans, uh, violence including murder, we get incensed uh, in our system and we make statements, we bring groups together, uh, we may sponsor legislation or not, and then we go on to the next topic. And it's frustrating because there is no next topic. This is the topic. This is what we have to fix in our society and in public education or else our students, and in particular, our underserved and underrepresented students won't have the opportunities to realize their dreams and live safe, healthy lives. And so no more topics. Uh, let's stay the course. You're going to hear in a minute that it acts that we want to move from words to action, measurable, strategic, intentional actions. And um, we will share more about that. The other thing that I wanted to say is we cannot pretend that there is not structural systemic racism in America. There is, and all you have to do is look at the data. Look at the data on suspension and expulsion rates for students of color. Look at the school to prison pipeline data. Look at Minneapolis, where law enforcement are seven times more likely to use force against black Americans than their white counterparts. Look at nationally, where two and a half times black Americans are likely to be killed by law enforcement than white Americans. The data is there. We have systemic and structural racism and injustices in this country, and we can't address it if we don't call it out. Um, so tonight we're going to have a conversation. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions. We're going to let each of the panelists respond to, to a question. Uh, we'll save some time for Q&A in the end. We'd ask you to put those questions in the comment section and we'll record them here. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll have time for Q&A in the end. I've been on panels with this group before. They've got a lot to say. Uh, but before we get to the panelists, and I'll introduce them in a minute, let me um, bring to the screen our state president, Dr. Linda Kamensky, a Latinx superintendent. Since I've known her, has been a strong advocate for the underserved and underrepresented in her care, but as, as well throughout the state. And uh, Dr. Kamensky, welcome. Linda, thanks for being here with us. We're going we're gonna to start with you. And as, as we see the visual demonstrations, not just in our country, but around the world, uh, it's generated discussions about race and racism in our society. As we've seen the impact of the murder of George Floyd, we've seen people stand up and speak out. Uh, share with us your thoughts about the demonstrations and then and, and maybe as or more importantly, what does AXA need to do moving forward to answer the call and to act and not just speak? Thank you, Wes. And oh, such an important question. First of all, I have to say, personally, just the shock again to see somebody murdered for no reason, to see a black American murdered for no reason. And to know that that can still happen in our country after decades of work to try to end racism, and we haven't succeeded. And then to see the protesters, the march, the people who march, and to see so many people of so many colors and majority youth is so inspiring to me. 
And it reminds me, years ago when I was a young girl, I was in a march for the same thing. And we weren't able to achieve our dreams. And I think at the time it was because we didn't have, we hadn't reached that tipping point and we didn't have support of broad-based coalition of people of all ages and all colors working together to change our system so that every student, every child can grow up loved, appreciated, educated, and ready for the future. And in my career as an educator, I've always tried to focus on equity and excellence wherever I am, whatever district, whatever school I was in. And this year as president, that's been our theme. And yet I also realized I'm close to the end of my presidency, that theme can't end now, especially now. It cannot end. It has to be part of our breath and our, our life purpose of what we are here for. And so I'm very excited about the fact that, and to announce to you today that we're going to start a task force. AXA is going to begin to take what we know already and put it into action. And it's, it's co-sponsored with California School Boards Association. I'm delighted to have their partnership. It's going to be open to people of all ages. We want students there, parents, teachers, staff members, um, ed, equity advocates, whoever can come to the table, can come to help us move from just words to the concrete actions so that we really take the steps forward and really do create that future that all kids deserve. So please join me. Think about what your work is. Think about how you can join us. We need you to help us. Thank you, Wes. Uh, inspiring to hear you speak from the heart and you do it whenever you have the mic and thanks for your leadership this year it's been it's been great working with you and Linda's going to teach a class tonight so she's doing double duty or else she would have been here the, the whole time so thank you let, let me now, uh, turn and introduce this this amazing panel of experts true experts and friends um, we've got Dr. Alicia Smith Ariaga the executive director of Education Trust West with us tonight Glad that she's here. We've got Carla Plitez Howell, Managing Director of Policy and Programs for the Advancement Project of California. We have Audine Max, Senior Director of Equity and Diversity here at AXA. Glad to have him in that role. Can't tell you how excited I am to work with him in this work. And Dr. Ken Magdaleno, Executive Director for the Center for Leadership, Equity and Research, CLEAR. Uh, so to all of you, thank you for making time. Uh, we're going to start right away with the questions. Adne, I'm going to start with you. Uh, and the first question is this. What, what are your thoughts similarly about the uprisings uh, in our country and in the world? And then your thoughts about police brutality and school policing. Hey, Wes, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Um, and I appreciate your leadership on that, allowing us to the space to have this conversation. Um, as, as I've been thinking about what's been going on, the uprisings um, around this entire country, around this world, um, it makes me think about my own upbringing and, and what I saw growing up and the anger that has been sustained over the years. And, and I think that's what you're seeing now. You're seeing a lot of young folks um, who remember Ferguson and didn't see the action that they expected. Uh, didn't see the results that they expected. And they come into 2020 and, and we see George Floyd. And before that, um, all of the names, Breonna Taylor, and, and all of the names that we've heard of, of African-Americans being killed uh, in their community. And they're angry, they're upset. They wanna see a result. Um, and it, it harkens me back to 1992 and Rodney King when, when I was one of those young folks uh, upset about this and seeing people, seeing police officers acquitted. Um, that anger has sustained now. And, and at that time, it was even my thoughts were, oh, here we go again. Uh, we expect them to get off. Um, and, and now we're seeing something different. You're seeing these young, these youth um, being active and, and pushing for change and wanting to force change and being active in their community, being active voters. Uh, that's what we're seeing. And unfortunately, 
the issue of priest brutality seems like it's not going away. Um, it was the same way with my grandfather when, and it was Jim Crow during that time, or it was the same way when my father was growing up in Berkeley. And, and it's one of the reasons why the Black Panthers were created. And it's the same thing that I've seen all through my adulthood, um, all the way from 92. And, and it's something that needs to change. And you'll hear a lot of different aspects of what that looks like and what that means, um, whether it's defunding police departments or looking for some systemic change that can happen in our communities. And black folks across this entire country are angry and tired of what has been going on. Uh, and we really wanna see something happen. Um, and I expect to see that same sustained intensity occur in our schools. Uh, because it's not just it's not just, it's not just adults having this conversation. It's our children, and and when I'm talking to my 14 year old son and discussing with him about what he needs to do and and the different rules that exist for him, folks want to see the rules equal. They don't want to be told, "Hey, uh, don't wear your hoodie in public because it's not safe." Those are things that people don't want to hear anymore. Uh, the parents don't wanna to talk to their children and give them specific rules about how to deal with the police department. And those things need to change and it's about time. Uh, and I think that's what, what I'm feeling. And I think that's what the rest of my community is feeling. So thank you, Wes, I appreciate this. Oh, thank you, man. I've known you a long time. Um, the sincerity in your voice is unavoidable, man. Um, Carla, let's let's allow you to address the the same questions about the demonstrations, uh, police brutality, uh, school policing, and I know you had some actionable activities that you're seeing in the field. Again, we want to move from talk to action. So, uh, Carla, take it away. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, thank you to um, you all for actually lifting this conversation. Uh, moving very, very quickly um, and, and taking the seriousness out of this. I, I loved uh, the opening remarks. Um, we should be outraged. Um, and I hear that a lot of people that face this every day are just tired. Um, there's so much pain, um, but the outrage should be carried by all of us. So this conversation is critical. And then when we add uh, the COVID-19 pa pandemic disproportionately impacting communities, the data is very, very clear um, that communities of color are being hit the hardest. Um, and seeing the protests and reaction to police brutality, to vigilante killings, um, th this is really shedding the light on the double pandemic that's really facing our black brothers and sisters. So we're, we're really tired. Um, Advancement Project and the equity partners we work with are exhausted of just having conversations and love uh, what you all are doing of turning this into action. So one of the issues we really wanted to lift up is we, we talk about equity um, and there's been folks across the field, um, many different partners that are saying, yes, we're, we're ready to address racial equity. Um, and behind that, the reason why we're still here is what people have been asking for is something that resembles equity, um, but actually doesn't get us to the concrete actions that will change the lives of the black and brown students, indigenous students that consistently showed uh, different outcomes and data. So one of the examples we've wanted to share um, in Los Angeles Unified School District, when local control funding formula passed um, in 2014, LAUSD took a really hard look of uh, how are we going to define equity that's different. Um, and, and LCFF leaves out black students. Um, LCFF um, couldn't uh, take into consideration race. Um, but LAUSD said, we know there are communities that are hit hardest. We know that there are communities that are facing uh, conditions that are different. Um, so. In 2018, board member Garcia, Monica Garcia, um, with the help of uh, different equity partners, pushed for having a conversation about what would it look like if we actually funded our schools differently and took the local control funding formula and funneled those dollars to historically underadvantaged um, schools, historically schools that had not received funding we did an assessment of um, the racial makeup of these schools um, and, and to no one's surprise on this call, 
a majority of the students were black, a majority of the students were Latinos, um, and, and these were the schools we were investing in um, the least amount. Um, so LAUSD adopted an equity need formula um, that took into account our TSP students, but also added the conditions of um, what, what is community violence like um, in those schools? What are the asthma rates um, in those schools? Uh, and by adding these um, factors, we, we were able to show where more of our black and brown students are. Um, and it isn't something that looks at, here's uh, what our students um, are coming in with deficits, but rather looks at the community as a whole. Um, that local that um, student equity need index allocated $263 million to high and highest need schools. And what's really remarkable is that the students in those schools received additional counseling. There's math collaboratives now that look at academic rigor um, and there's additional staffing with principals. Um, so a really, really um, great example of how we could turn some of this into action. No, thank you. And thanks for bringing um, examples uh, how we can again operationalize our intentions and and measure the outcomes and i know los angeles unified is doing some great work so so thank you for that we're going to move to question two in a second for uh, alicia and ken but did either of you want to comment on this before we move to the next question all right then we'll we'll jump into question two and alicia i'm going to throw it to you first but we believe that definitions are important so the conversation we're having uh, is the same conversation so how do you define systemic or structural racism and can you give some examples that demonstrate that it is in public education sure wes and thanks so much for having me today and really excited for this conversation to be focused on action and what we can do um, in this moment and when we think about systemic racism and what it is, it is when systems and the entities associated with those systems perpetuate the inequalities that we see in society. Um, and so you might wonder what does it look like for a system to be racist? Um, and we know that we see this in a lot of education systems and the way that we know it's apparent is in some of the outcomes that we see. So for example, for the past year or so, we have at Education Trust West talked a lot about math scores in our state and how disproportionately black students and Latinx students, uh, approximately 80% in eighth grade and 11th grade are not meeting math standards. Now, when we talk about those results, we are seeing the results of systematic racism. And you might wonder, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? And we know that that percent of students not meeting standards is not about students not having the capability to do the work, but it's about all the pieces of the system that work against them. So for instance, we know that black students and Latinx students are disproportionately in schools that have less access to highly qualified math teachers. We also know that math is a topic that is much more impacted by bias than the other subjects in terms of what we see students and then assume that they are capable of achieving. And so we see systematic racism play out and how students end up um, actually being able to achieve in math. Now, in terms of solutions, one of the things that I really like to focus on today is there is an opportunity coming up this very Wednesday to think about if we know that systemic racism is an issue and we know that racism is built into systems, then that means when we create policies that impact systems, we have to take race into account. Race conscious policy is imperative in making sure that we can undo the racism that we see and we that has happened for years and years that is clearly built into systems. One very clear policy that is up for a vote this Wednesday in the state assembly is ACA 5. ACA 5 is a bill that will repeal Prop 209. And Prop 209 is the piece of legislation that got rid of affirmative action in California almost 30 years ago. Now, Carla, who spoke before me, talked a lot about the great work in LAUSD 
and how they were able to really funnel resources to the students that needed it most. But you'll notice there are a lot of hoops they had to jump through just to target those resources. What an affirmative action allows us to do is say, hey, we know that there's racism in the system, and how do we target the resources to the students who we know need it? So I would urge everyone on this call to either contact your assembly member in support of ACA 5, or if you're part of a school district or county office, or just an individual who wants to see justice done and make sure that we can actually right the wrongs that we are talking about on this call, is going to be important to support ACA 5 in the assembly this week, to support it in the Senate in the weeks to come, and then to support it on the ballot in November. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia, and thanks for calling out ACA 5 by name. Um, hopefully, GR can put a link to some information in the chat box for any of our members to need grassroots tools relative to that. Um, we're going to pass it over to Ken now. Um, Ken, why don't you share your definition for structural or systemic racism and where it exists plainly in public education? Sure, Wes. Thanks. Um, you know, I've been listening to everyone and it, it Everyone is uh, is providing some fantastic information. Um, I, I heard a couple of years ago that structural racism is the silent opportunity killer. And I believe it was Maya Wiley of the Center for Social Inclusion that used that term. And that is so real. The, the uh, opportunity to rise up through the system, the opportunity to be able to meet and, and reach beyond your dreams is uh, such a, uh, an important opportunity to do. But systemic racism absolutely uh, prevents that from happening more often than not. You know, uh, we've often said, people of color have often said, we not only have to do, uh, you know, twice as much, but work twice as hard. And the system, in fact, has been inequitable from the very beginning. And so people who have had to uh, work their way up through the system have seen the, um, the racism, have seen where they are often treated as second-class citizens having to do twice as much to be able to reach their goals. Um, one of the things that I've often said to, to instructors, to leaders about the students in the state of California is don't take their hope away. Do not take their hope away. Many of our students, many of our teachers and leaders, after a period of time, are very tired and we need to be able to move beyond the talking stage to say no this time it is not we're not going backwards we're through with going backwards the generations after us depend on us to be able to move to the next level of this clear is part of the uh, fixed school discipline coalition a group of about 30 coalition members that have been addressing school discipline. Now, as a former assistant principal, principal, I can tell you, very often our kids of color are sent to the office in a inequitable amount of numbers for the smallest things. And much of that, Wes, is because staff faculty, whoever it may be, do not understand how different cultures work, how different races work, and the value they look through the deficit model rather than through the asset model. All of that to say that we need to address systemic racism, structural racism, and systemic oppression in all its different uh, forms. Thank you. Yeah, Ken, th thank you for that. Before we move on to the, the next question uh, we have here, I just didn't know if Carla or Alicia, you wanted to say anything more about that or Adne? 
All right, then we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Then we just want to make sure we give people a chance. If you're if you're itching to say something, just just say it. We'll uh, we'll get it in there. We'll cut it. It'll, it'll look clean. Um, Adnan, I'm going to throw this one uh, to you first, and, and I think you and I were at this same uh, dinner table together. And I know he wouldn't mind me saying it, but one of the people I look up to is Eric Andrew. Uh, I admire him. He's he's a friend. He's a mentor. And someone said, "Well, you know." It, the thing for me is I'm colorblind. I don't, I don't see color. And I've never seen Eric turn like that. It scared me because he was he looked like he was about ready to stand up and like say something um, with with words we don't use in public a lot because he was he was upset. And he said, you better never say that to me again. Remember that? He said, I do. you better see me as a black man every time you look at me because that's exactly what I am. And I was I was like. <coughs> Wow. Right. And so speak to that for us. This 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 idea of, of colorblind or silence and the danger of each. Thanks, Wes. Um, yeah. So I, too, have had that conversation with a good friend of mine who's a, a teacher and, and she was talking about how she didn't see color. I just see my students and and she's a good friend of mine. We grew up together and I looked at her. And my response was, you know, all you're doing is disrespecting me. You're disrespecting my color. Uh, you're disrespecting my culture and the ancestors who I, who laid the foundation for me to be here. And, and I said that to say, look, I, I want to be looked at as someone who's black. I am a black man. It's part of my identity. It is who I am. And that should be celebrated. It shouldn't be dismissed or disrespect it, it should be celebrated. It's okay to celebrate diversity. It's okay that we have different celebrations and we eat different foods. Um, and I used to tease her, I said, because when you come to my house for dinner versus when I go to your house for dinner, and sometimes at her house, it might be very quiet conversation. At my house, you can't get a word in. And and it's a challenge and, and everyone's talking loud and there's, but it's not, we're not angry. That's just how we, how we communicate with each other. It's how we celebrate each other. And, and that should be celebrated regardless of where you come from. Um, you shouldn't be looking at people that they're colorblind. You should be celebrating their differences, engaging in their differences, learning about their differences, because if you can do that, then you can teach those children. See, if you understand where they come from, if you understand their cultures, then you can understand them. And it's important to understand the children that we're teaching in our classrooms. So then you don't get the things that, for example, the comments that my son gets a lot in the classroom. Oh, you're, you're disrespectful. Why are you talking out loud? I didn't call on you. You're intimidating. Right. He doesn't get the terms. He's assertive. He doesn't get those things. If you understand that in our family, I in, I challenge my children to speak up. I challenge them to question things that I say, to question people's thoughts, to ensure that what they're hearing is truthfulness and honesty and to always check for understanding. That's how I want my children to be raised, and that's how I want them to be in the classroom. And so being colorblind has always been something that's disrespectful, and I can understand why Eric got upset at that time, because for him to not see him as a black man, that's important to him as much as it is important to me. Thanks, Wes. No, thank you. Um, Ken, we're going to let you speak to this notion of colorblind, but also this idea of silent towards racism and the impact that that has on the system. Thanks, Wes. The, um, there's a book that I'm currently reading. Um, it's about race and having conversations about race. And in, in the book, the author uses, uh, he equates color blindness with color muteness. In other words, the, the fact that you say I'm colorblind and I see all students the same 
means that you want to go somewhere where you don't have to have the discussions about race and culture and equity and the different isms that we study and encounter on a daily basis. And so it's, a, it's an easy out, in my opinion. Um, and, and in essence, what you're doing is taking away the soul of the child because uh, if say they say they are Native American, say that they are Latino, African American, white, you are taking away their soul when you say that I see all children the same because we don't treat them all the same. And so I've I've often said that that uh, color blindness is uh, is just an escape to move on to the next subject. And, and it is absolutely um, it, it is absolutely unfair to our kids. And Ad and I said something that is really important. Uh, I recall being in a uh, classroom with uh, as a guest, and some way the the folks were talking about the different races and such and how the kids are behaving. And one of the instructors said, "Well, I expect them to." Uh, I forget. I accept them. Expect them to, to basically kneel to my authority, and I looked at him and said, "You are asking for nothing but trouble because what you're doing is you're taking away their dignity and respect." Um, I wanted to to mention Adonai's son, who's 14, African American. Uh, over the years, I've had discussions also with leaders and teachers and, and frankly have said that we have to get over the fear of kids of color. Many people, many of our teachers have never been around the neighborhoods and the cultures where our kids come from. And there is a certain amount of fear to that. We need to face it. We need to learn more about each other the more we learn about each other, the less we will fear each other. Much of this also goes on. You know, I spoke of color muteness, and just give me a second here. If you ever have an opportunity, speak or re rather read Carolyn Shields' article on uh, dialogic leadership for social justice, overcoming pathologies of silence. Silence is also defeating your spirit and your rights as an as an educator when you when you are silent you are saying that what is occurring is okay i realize it's awfully difficult for some people to speak up but there are different ways of addressing something that is racist something that um, minimizes someone's race or culture or gender and silence is basically saying i approve move on thanks wes yeah i can thank you um before we go on to question four alicia you or carla want to say anything to color blindness or silence about racism Sure, I'll I'll add something, uh, Wes. One of the things that um, was coming up for me and Ken, thanks so much for what you shared, was just around the fact that you know I I, I don't know that we can always assume that um, folks always know what it means. You know, I saw someone in the chat uh, say, "Well, what? How do I know if I'm being biased, or what does that look like?" And I'd love to point everyone to, and I'll share this link in the, I'm not sure how to post it in the public chat, but I'll post it in the private chat and maybe we can get it over. But um, to Deborah Ball's work at University of Michigan, and she um, talks about observations she's done in math classrooms and how within a minute and 28 seconds, there are 20 judgment, judgments that a teacher makes. Um, and at every single one of those opportunities, there's an opportunity for bias to creep into that. The, that interaction between the teacher and the student. And so part of what we really have to do as educators is think about what are anti-racist teaching practices and how are we explicitly inserting them intentionally into our pedagogy at every step of the way. Um, and that's important in every subject 
And I would say, especially important in subjects like math and science, where we see these biases happen um, more and more. So once again, uh, Deborah Ball, University of Michigan, the link is there, but that illustrates um, what implicit bias can look like creeping into practices. And then uh, Professor Ball also outlines some of the anti-racist teaching practices that we can utilize to make sure that, that we're working to, that those don't, to ensure that those practices do not creep in as well. Alicia, thank you. Carla, did you want to speak to this also before we move on to the next question? Okay, I didn't see a hand up, so we'll 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 move along. Um, again, we said we want to move from words to actions with measurable outcomes, uh, strategic, intentional actions. Um, it, it looks like Carla might have dropped off uh, th these tech issues. They happen on it seems like every broadcast I watch, even on the Today Show. Um, so we'll get her back on here. Uh, but but let let's talk about actions. Uh, intentional, strategic, measurable. Uh, and so Alicia, I'll go to you. What, what can associations like ours, you and I work together a ton. Well, what more can and should we do? What do we need to do from legislation to programming, to training, to what have you? Uh, why don't you start? And then I think we got Carla back. We'll get her back on in a second then. Sure, happy to start, Wes. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I just, I can't reiterate enough how much ACA5 and the work around being able to actually implement race conscious policies is important. And then alongside that, um, especially the work around recruiting and retaining teachers of color is extremely important as well. And so actually pre-COVID, Ed Trust West was working in really close partnership with AXA and others on, um, some a uh, piece of collateral that talked about how to integrate uh, anti-racist practices into hiring and how to think about um, retention policies that really focused on keeping Black and Latinx teachers um, over longer periods of time. Um, because we know that the research shows that students who are able to have educators at some point in their career um, who are um, not only for students of color, but for all students, um, it is really helpful in terms of students' academic outcomes. And so really looking at recruitment and retention purpose, uh, re recruitment and retention strategies are super important. And then making sure that not only are those those new strategies in place, but they're actually being implement implemented at the site level, at the school level, um, at the district level, and we're really excited to continue partnering with AXA and others um, on some of these important issues around um, educators. Yeah, thanks, Felicia. And that was, that was great work that started and, and has to continue. Uh, as you know, I, I brought Manny to uh, USC to, to speak to my class. And some of the data that um, I hadn't seen presented like that before also, and, and you just alluded to this, it, it speaks to research that demonstrates the value of white students having teachers of color in their classrooms, that they are better problem solvers, that they are more innovative, that they work more collaboratively. So the, the, the teacher pipeline and having a diverse teacher pipeline is good for everybody and ought to be something that, that we, um, we all promote. And then that has to look the same in administration, right? So uh, teachers and teacher's assistants uh, and classified folks of color who become administrators of color, who become superintendents of color, who become school board members that prioritize hiring diverse workforces, right? And, and that's, we got to get there. Anyway, I'm going to listen. Uh, Carla, you're, uh, how about, how about from Advancement Project California? What are, what are some of these things that I know you've seen working out there that we all should be doing more of um, yeah. and take from this conversation and, and get to action. Yeah. Um, yeah, apologies about dropping off all. Um, I, I want to start with the dangers of not talking about race. Um, so as a young Latina that was an immigrant um, that came into our public education system, um, I, I was never asked about my race. There were assumptions of I would learn a certain way. Um, and that hurts the soul um, and, and it'll hurt our nation, our state, um, if we don't have those conversations. 
And if that sort of value doesn't move us um, legally, uh, when we look at color blindness um, or passing legislation, when we look at Prop 209, we're not supposed to talk about race. Um, and we systemically find ourselves with students of a certain race uh, in the lower realms. Um, and we don't talk about race and we skirt around it. Um, as we mentioned, the equity need index, um, we, we had to find every way to talk about race without actually saying black and brown students or else those policies wouldn't pass. Um, so the actual dangers, we're in the middle of it. Um, and this moment is really the, the outrage of we're, we're still here having that conversation because we, we think it's okay to think about uh, color blindness. Um, in places where we do recognize that we have to support our black or Latino or indigenous students or dual language learners um, differently, we, we actually see different outcomes. Um, so the two very concrete examples I want to give, um, one is in talking with principals uh, in districts throughout Southern California, there are principals uh, that create what's called uh, data war rooms, um, war, W-A-R. Um, and what these principals do is um, they, they take every last um, test um, with uh, uh, students um, and lay it out. Um, there, there's a really amazing principal um, at LAUSD that we've been doing a lot of work with. Um, and he basically has every student listed. Um, and, and here are the things that um, uh, student X might need help with. Here are the, student, the things that student Y might need help with. Um, and then actually develops a plan using the data on how these students are performing academically. And this principle is committed, committed to bringing up scores for black and brown students because that's predominantly who he serves um, in his school in South LA. Um, so that's a really concrete example of um, at, at the sort of school site level. At a systemic level, when I think of uh, structural racism, I, I think of a sort of pyramid. Um, and when we're addressing, giving policy recommendations for addressing uh, structural racism, we do a really good job at uh, staying on top of that uh, sort of, I, I should say iceberg, on top of that uh, level where we address sort of events. Um, we, we might have conversations. We, we might bring a convening of leaders together. Th those are events, they're, they're not getting under the surface. Under the surface lies things like individual behaviors. All of us, all of us have um, different racial uh, um, mental models um, that, that we have, we, we inherited, um, we uh, are maybe proud of, may not be proud of us, and that's all of us. So uh, addressing sort of like the behavior, and, and I think those are some of the things that our panelists uh, are getting to. Under that are some structural issues, and, and these are created by law. Um, so we think of creating um, structural issues for offering supports. Um, so um, we, we do this uh, with different offices, task force. One of the things I want to offer here, and a really concrete example is creating an office of equity, but not just one. Um, we, we do a really good job of the one-off, um, but creating a system that actually has an office of equity throughout the state. So one potential way of structuring this is the California Department of Education has an office of equity that analyzes data that sees uh, where certain districts um, are falling short or might be uh, really supporting black students. But that needs to be connected with local offices of equity. So in San Bernardino, there's an office of equity that specifically addresses, addresses the needs of um, historically um, ignored um, students. Um, and if we connected this, uh, the local with the statewide level, I think we would have a better way of actually putting in systemic structures um, that call out black students, that call out Latinx students, that call out dual language learners, and we don't skirt around it. Um, and the three things that this could do one is we continue to track and analyze student outcomes that really put a racial uh, equity lens. Um, and then secondly, there's uh, actual guidance of curriculum standards that address these needs where we don't ignore um, race and culture, um, but we embrace it and actually use that um, for the learning um, of students. Um, and then third, that there is accountability, and I, I know accountability triggers stuff um, in all of us, um, 
but the accountability of um, where do we see results um, for the students that we've called out. Um, and critical to this is actually working with community-based organizations at the local level so that this doesn't stay um, a uh, work with um, um, sort of uh, elected um, work with some of the folks that are uh, leading schools, um, but community engagement is really, really critical. And, and this is what we've seen in the uh, San Bernardino. This is what we've seen in LAUSD in order to constantly bring up the voices of the students um, in building this infrastructure. Um, but we, we really have to think about building infrastructure um, and, and not staying at um, hosting some of the events, um, but how do we bake uh, equity and racial justice into our systems? Well, Carla, thank you. That's great stuff. Um, I would encourage folks that are watching tonight, put your questions into the chat so we can paste them to our group. Ken, I'm going to go to you in a second. You answered a question that I'm going to go to. Um, but before I get there, so Ken, I'm, I'm, I'm getting you ready. For the, for the one that you answered. Before I get there, I want to go to Adene because, you know, we've, we've been really blessed at accident. We've had some great senior directors, uh, Nicole and Marguerite. And, and this question is about what do associations do intentionally to improve um, structural racism, to eradicate it? Now you're coming into AXA, you, you know, in this role, you've been at AXA a long time. What are you excited about? Uh, working on and bringing as you look forward. So I know you've put in a lot of thought to this. So just not to put you on the spot, but as you, you know, as, as you take on this mantle and, and you're helping the largest administrator association in the country address this topic, what are you excited about doing moving forward? Well, you know, I, I am really excited about taking this work and, and really training our members um, on what this work looks like and developing something that gets down to so they can change the systemics change how we're educating our kids uh change how our leaders think about the work um and some of that we've already started but of course uh there's always rooms for opportunity and growth um and so to give you an idea we've already started some work of looking at all of access academies and and putting in some some ideas and some, some rubrics about how we go about ensuring that a conversation around equity is actually occurring when we're training the principals and superintendents and HR directors uh, that go through all of our programs. And of course, we always need to take the next step. We wanna take that next step and, and embed all of this work and have this discussion about race. So not only are we gonna train the next group of school leaders about equity and what it means to be an equity warrior on the school side campus. But we need to train folks to have this conversation around race. And that's the next iteration that gets me excited is to, is to be able to give people the tools to have these conversations on their campuses. Um, and the same with, we have our own credentialing program and we do some great work and we've been recognized for some of our great work with our credentialing program. And we certainly want to continue to improve that. Um, so when we're looking at, even when we're talking about teacher credentialing and principal credentialing, um, to get those credentials, not just stopping at the programs that AXA provides, but also looking the policy in our state and engaging our higher ed partners on changing the paradigm on what it takes to become a teacher in this state and looking at some of that work and what it means and having those discussions and uh, changing the curriculum around educating our own instructors to ensure that they're having these conversations about race, that they know what it means um, to talk about the biases, the implicit biases that exist in all of us, and to have that discussion so that they can break their own stereotypes about our children and don't bring that into the classroom. Uh, and then finally, one piece that's really getting me excited that, that I intend to work on um, and really look at how we can design our programs around this, and that is diversifying the workforce in our schools. Um, you heard Alicia talk about the teachers of color and moving forward and, and designing some, 
strategies for that. Uh, that's something that I think that is, that's been missing a little bit. How do we give tools to our HR directors, to our principals, to our superintendents that can engage them in a conversation about what it means to diversify the workforce? Because it's no longer sufficient just to put out a job description and then take whoever comes in. We have to be intentional about this work. We have to be intentional to look for uh, black males who we know our young children are looking for as role models. We have to be intentional to find our Latino brothers, our Latina sisters to come into the classroom, our Asian and Pacific Islander uh, brothers and sisters to come into the classroom. And we have to be intentional to recruit them to ensure that we have folks in the classroom and in leadership positions that look like the students that we're teaching every day. And so those are the things that I'm really excited about to make part of AXA's platform uh, and to really change this paradigm as we move forward. Thanks, Wes. No, thank you. I, I told you from the beginning of this broadcast how excited I am. What's interesting is that when, and I think AXA was one of the first groups in the state to, to bring this position, this office in. Um, and I got a call from Ken Magdalena. I don't know if he remembers it or not, but he said, Wes, you got to be careful with this idea because it can't be the job of one person to lead equity in any association. It's all of our job. And, and he said, and I'm calling you out because it's especially your job. And, and I just want, you know, and Adne knows this. Um, he is our thought leader. He is in many ways an inspiration in this work for us, but it is all of our jobs. And we can only affect change if we're all working together. Every one of us has an obligation, moral, ethical, um, and professional to do this work. So Adne, again, just excited. One of the questions that came in, I think it was from Deborah P, if I'm reading this correctly. Um, the question is basically, how do you know as an educator if you have unintentional bias in teaching? And then what tools are out there to help us become more conscious of our own bias and prejudice? And so, Ken, did you want to, you answered that. Uh, would you like to answer that for everybody? Yeah, I um, actually, I'd like to answer that and maybe one more comment. The, uh, what I indicated is that uh, we all have, we all have some sort of impl implicit bias and, and you know, um, we hear so often about bias with white folks. Well, to be very frank, um, all of us have some sort of bias. And being able to understand that, and it's, it's like, Wes, the reason that a lot of people of color don't like talking about race anymore is because we feel like nothing's going to change. And white people don't like being talked to about race or talked about race because they're afraid they're going to be called a racist. And it's it sort of goes along with the bias that we have in that we need to recognize that this is something that, that we all have. The aspect of, um, of addressing, this is where else I wanna go with this. One of the one of the exercises I had my master's degree students do long ago was listen to the language, listen to what is said in classrooms and on school sites, listen to the deficit comments that are made, and you will be amazed at how the culture of a school can be changed if the language changes. If you recognize bias, if you learn about race, what is race, what isn't race, um, all of those are part of what needs to be done. And I saw on the live comments that someone mentioned uh, teacher credentialing. We had this conversation earlier. Having been a, um, a professor in higher ed for about 15 years, I would like nothing better than to see schools of education mandated to teach race at every 
credential level, whether it is teacher credentialing, administrator credentialing, and even in doctoral programs. I shared that in, in teacher credentialing programs, maybe 50% of students had ever addressed race. In doctoral, my doctoral program, it was not that much better. So we have people teaching and directing districts who have never had the conversation about race. And uh, I really believe that, that it needs to be mandatory. Teaching about race, critical race theory and such needs to be mandatory. And so um, it, there is one more thing here, Wes, I don't know. Remember that the praxis, I use praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, which is intentional activism. I believe that's where we need to go, and I'm looking forward to assisting. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, we've got another question that came in. I, I, I do want to take one more question and then finish with giving each of you a chance to say whatever you want to say uh, to, to close us out. But Roxana uh, Bautista Villasenor, one of our AXA loyal members, uh, she wrote, if equity was a value adopted by all educational systems, what would that look like? Who wants to take that on? I'll, I'll be, hi Roxana. Uh, I know Roxana well, I mentored her once or twice. Um, remember, and, and I'm sure you're aware that there's a difference between equity and equality. Very often people equate the two, that equality is the same. Well, remember that equality is everyone getting the same thing. Equity is meeting the needs of each person. So if school districts were really intent on providing equity to children on a regular basis, it would look completely different than what it does now. And perhaps this is a time for systemic change, that equity be at the forefront along with addressing race. How, what would it look like? Probably uh, a bit more chaotic than what it might be now. Kids not sitting in chairs, listening to the same thing, but a different model. There's much more, many more people, much smarter than I am in what that might look like. But I just wanted to share that it, it's, they're not the same thing. And it, this is a wonderful time to move forward towards equity uh, as a state. Would, would another panelist like to answer that as well for them, their vision, um, if equity was realized, what would that look like in the system? Wes, I'm happy to jump in. So for me, as I think about what equity would look like in this system, I actually was thinking that, you know, one of the things that would look like is us pushing back on that question just a little bit. I think for a long time now, we've used the word, I mean, and we, we do it too at Ed Trust West, we've used the word equity, and it means so many different things to so many different people. And I might push back on all of us and say, what would it look like instead in every meeting that we set in and every conversation that we were having that we thought that we spoke up and said, well, what are the racist implications that the decisions that we're making at this moment might have? And that instead of naming equity, that we name race explicitly. And this moment, I feel more than any um, you know, there are a lot of moments <laughs> that call for this, but this particular moment. Um, pushes even us even further to really be explicit that we're talking about race. And I'll, I'll just take this as my opportunity for my last comment too. So I would say, you know, at the state level, what that looks like is making race conscious policy like ACA 5. At the district and school level, that looks like having race conscious conversations around recruitment and retention and about anti-racist teaching practices like the ones that I mentioned for Dr. Ball from Dr. Ball at University of Michigan. And then at the individual level, it means that when we're in a situation or we're, we're in a room where a decision is being made, that we are the person who raises our hand and says, hey, I, have we thought about what implications this, this may have that are recreating the systematic racism that's already a part of the system? Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Um, we're, we're at our time, but I'd, I'd like to let the panelists each um, share any closing thoughts they have or if they wanted to say something sooner or they saw a question and want to um, uh, address it, uh, address it now. And Carla, why don't we start with you and uh, we'll, we'll let you uh, lead us home. Yes, um, totally echo what Alicia said as well. Um, and I've got to say, um, 2020 um, will, will be a year to be remembered. Um, and, and the thing that really strikes me is uh, when I think of 2020, I think of like 2020 vision um, and the unprecedented um, racial inequities that we're seeing at this moment really require us to act. Um, so I'll leave with uh, two things. Um, one, when I think about equity, we, we can't get there without community and student voice um, and making sure that that's part of every conversation um, and every decision and policy that's made. Um, Two, uh, we, we have the data. Um, it is unacceptable. Um, I, I was at a district uh, about two weeks ago um, and math scores were going down. Um, there was about 7% of um, the students in this particular school that had passed um, two years ago and the number was going down to zero. Um, and that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, and making sure that we use data to change that. Um, I will conclude with, we, we need funding for this. Um, so Advancement Project is really supportive of schools and communities first. Um, it is now on the ballot. Um, so also reminding folks that when we talk about um, changing some of these structures, um, that we're going to need funding to do that. So I do hope a lot of you will support that. Thank you so much. Um, Adonai, how about a final comment, thought from you? Uh, I'd just like to say this. Um, we have reached a point in time where we have some opportunities to make some change. Uh, the, the uprisings, the um, protests, they are forcing us to look at some serious issues that we have known have needed to change our entire careers, our entire lives. And so I'm gonna challenge myself to not let it go, to stay, stay true to, to myself, to the foundation for which I stand on, um, having this lens to, to look at the work differently and to challenge others to step to the plate uh, and look at how we can change our educational system to benefit the kids who have been underserved for the entire creation of the system. Uh, and so I'm gonna make that sort of the, the foundation of my work. Um, and I'm looking at this as an opportunity that has come along and I'm gonna grasp that and move forward. And we need partners. It can't just be AXA, uh, it can't be CLEAR only, it can't be Ed Trust West or the Advancement Project. It's gonna take all of us. And I look forward to collaborating uh, with all of our panelists on this um, to really reshape education as we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ken, anything you'd like to say to, to kind of finalize your thoughts tonight? You know, there's actually a question on the uh, comments that speaks to uh, how do we empower our black and brown leaders? Uh, well, someone just took it. How do we empower our black and brown leaders when their leaders may be in the way? Um, you know, some of us older folks that don't want to let go sometimes. And um, however, I, I think it's really important to not move people out of the way as much as learn from their trials and tribulations and, and perhaps find something else for them to do. You know, I was the developer of the CALSA mentoring program and now the CLEAR mentoring program. And some of our best mentors are people who have decided that perhaps they can't stay up with everything, but what they have to offer because it's our culture, we listen we listen and we learn and we honor. And maybe we've gotten away from that. Um, I don't, uh, I very much respect the question because I think it has some validity to it. 
However, perhaps we've gotten into the wrong mindset. Perhaps we've assimilated too much in moving people out of the way. But let's take advantage of what we have to offer and what we have to share. Um, I've always said as someone who develops mentoring programs that my job is to make sure you don't hit the landmines that I hit. My job is to make sure your road is smoother. And my job is really to make sure that you reach beyond what I've ever been able to reach. And so let's let's learn and, and value the culture, value the race, value the gender, and and really take advantage and build it, build a togetherness. Yeah, Ken, thank you. Alicia, that last comments for you. That my comment before, I'll, I'll we'll leave it at that, that it's just important for us to be explicit about race and that we have to name that for the future of kids to come. I have a five year old who's uh, in public school right now in California, and I don't want us to be having the same conversation when he graduates. And I'm hopeful that we won't. Thank you. And, and thanks. Thanks to all of you um, for being such tireless advocates for being allies, for being friends, for being mentors for a lot of years. Um, and I started with that, Alicia, as well, that I, we can't keep changing the subject and coming back to it. We got to keep focused on this issue. And so that's our commitment at AXES. We want to be action oriented. We want to keep this in front of all of us, in front of our communities, in front of legislators until it isn't a problem anymore. Um, so thank you all. And I would just say this. Finally, thanks to the team that helped pull this all together. A lot of people get involved, Adne and communications and IT and folks. Thank you all. Um, and let me just say this. If I've said anything tonight, as you know, um, I'm trying to be careful. Um, if I said anything out of ignorance to offend, I apologize. Please let me know. Um, I, I want to be better about the work always. Uh, and I make mistakes. I don't apologize about making people feel uncomfortable because I think we absolutely have to get really uncomfortable. Uh, this is kind of a nice group, actually. Um, uh, our discomfort isn't as great uh, as maybe some of the other conversations, but it's got to be there. But apologies for any ignorance on my behalf. And I just want to thank my friends again for being here tonight. We'll see you next Monday night on Common Purpose, Uncommon Times. Be safe, everybody.